12. Nicholas Murray Butler. Education for the State. Nicholas Murray Butler, 1862-1947, long president of Columbia University and often mentioned as a possible candidate for the presidency of the United States on the Republican ticket, played, in his earlier years, an important role in the development of American education. But was Butler an educational conservative? Politically, despite certain contradictions in his thinking, Butler represented a conservative republicanism. In 1924, when the income tax was as yet relatively new and mild, Butler stated bluntly that the 16th or income tax amendment levels to the ground all immunities that hitherto existed to protect private property. Private property is now wholly at the disposal of the Congress of the United States. Every constitutional protection was in effect undercut by the radical nature of that amendment, and the historian of the next century would, Butler believed, see it in that light. At that same time, in 1924, Butler opposed any attempts, such as the Oregon Law, to make elementary education a government monopoly. The purpose of education he defined as developing human personality to the largest possible comprehension of the many-sided world in which we live with a view to taking part in the life of that world and in some slight degree aiding it to progress. Butler spoke sharply, no doubt, with more than half an eye on Columbia and Columbia Teachers College, of those who are now laying down as a principle that there are no principles but that each individual, each group, each generation must follow its own instincts and respond to its own emotions, finding out from its own experience what is pleasurable and what is painful, what is useful and what is harmful. Such teaching reduces man with all his history to the level of an animal, with no past save such as is organised in his bodily reactions and his self-protecting and self-satisfying instincts. The American people were once substantially unanimous in their faith in certain fundamental principles of government and of life. More than once they did battle for those principles, but now their children are told that no such principles exist. Can we wonder that under such circumstances the foundations of government are changing? Butler stated the issue ably and at Columbia Teachers College, Kilpatrick, Rugg and others were well aware of this growing rift between Butler and Teachers College. But this statement by Butler was as much an indictment of himself as anyone else. The rift was an ironic one, in that Teachers College, originally the New York College for the Training of Teachers, was launched in 1886 under the presidency of Nicholas Murray Butler, changing its name to Teachers College in 1892. The college was established in parts by converting an earlier philanthropic association into an educational institution. Shortly prior to its establishment, young Butler, then a Columbia University fellow in philosophy, offered a series of lectures in education. It was predicted by others that the undertaking was futile, although Butler chose Saturday mornings in order to be available to both teachers and prospective teachers. Not only was the largest room at the university crowded, but 1,500 requests for tickets had to be declined. This interest, being refused developments at Columbia, led to the formation of the college with Butler as president. When the college petitioned Columbia for affiliation with the university, the university council, according to Butts, refused, stating, there is no such subject as education, and moreover, it would bring into the university women who are not wanted. Butler has given the actual text of the council report, which reads rather differently. The university council did not give an outright refusal, but suggested an alliance rather than consolidation.
Its first reason for rejecting consolidation was the necessity of maintaining a practice teaching school from kindergarten through high school, which was deemed an unwise responsibility. The second reason is that such consolidation as is proposed would introduce co-education into Colombia in a most pronounced form. Colombia would thus be committed to matters which were separate administrative decisions apart from consolidation. An alliance without consolidation was suggested but rejected by the trustees on both the same grounds which the council had urged against consolidation. The affiliation without consolidation was achieved, according to Butts, in 1898. Dr. Walter Hervey had succeeded Butler in 1891, serving until 1897. James E. Russell then served as dean from 1897 to 1927 and developed the school rapidly. His son, William F. Russell, then succeeded him. Butler became Dean of the Faculty and Professor of Philosophy and Education in 1890 and then, 12 years later, became President of Columbia University, serving for 40 years. Butler's rule was therefore a major one and his disagreement with the Columbia Teachers College he helped create an ironic one. Why the rift? Harold Rugg stated the case briefly some years later. Butler had begun his career as one of many current champions of the theory of evolution who sought to apply its significance to all of life. Butler's Principles of Education, of course, had, as its stated purpose, according to the Teacher's College Record for 1900, to lay the basis for a scientific theory of education considered as a human institution, the process of education is explained from the standpoint of the doctrine of evolution and the fundamental principles thus arrived at are applied from the threefold standpoints of the history of civilization, the developing powers of the child and the cultivation of individual and social efficiency. Butler's writings on education give clear-cut witness to this attempt as Rugg analysed it, the advocates in education of the theory of evolution were of two points of view, the conforming way and the creative path. Those who held, like Butler, to the conforming way were inconsistent evolutionists, in that they were past bound adhering to traditions, creeds, social classes and principles having no justification in evolution. The creative path held by those who recognised the law of change and flux saw the rise of the common man as the order of the day and looked to the future for evolution's highest quote-unquote laws rather than to a lower past. It refused to see any law as final. Thus, when Butler wrote, The modern world has sat at the feet of the ancient world for a long time but has not yet learned all that the ancient world has to teach. His thinking was traditionalist rather than evolutionary. In accepting evolution, he had acknowledged continuity and change to be the fundamental laws of being, but by his anti-pragmatism, he was unwilling to accept the logical implications of his position. Butler was thus rejecting the very educational philosophy he had helped set in motion. In his disagreements with Teachers College, Butler had the unhappy position of being in radical self-contradiction and hence unable to develop a valid case against Kilpatrick, Dewey, Rugg or any others of that school of thought. The problem was simply this. If all reality is continuous and hence equally ultimate, then there is no ground for preferring good to evil, life to death and any one thing to another, for all are equally absolute, equally valid and equally basic reality. All standards and differentiations are therefore invalidated and eroded. Moreover, if change together with continuity is the fundamental law of being, then change is merely change and never growth, and higher and lower, past and present are equally ultimate equally meaningful and equally meaningless. 
Because this was Butler's dilemma as well as that of those whom he criticised, he was unable to come to grips with the issue, and the more consistent adherence of continuity and change carried the day, and the progressive erosion of all meanings into the great commonality of the ocean of being continued apace, The seeds of that commonality were in Butler's educational thinking, not only in his adherence to evolution, but in his insistence that education in a democracy is a failure if it does not relate itself to the duties and opportunities of citizenship. In itself, this statement is harmless, but let us see in it the broader context of Butler's views on democracy and education. It is easy to cry liberty, equality and fraternity and to carve the words in letters of stone upon public buildings and public monuments. It is not so easy to answer the query whether, in truth, unrestricted liberty and perfect equality are at all compatible. For it has been pointed out that liberty leads directly to inequality based upon the natural differences of capacity and application among men. Equality, on the other hand, in any economic sense, is attainable only by the suppression in some degree of liberty in order that, directly or indirectly, the strong arm of the states may be able to hold back the precocious and to push forward the sluggish. Obviously, there is food for thought in this, thoughts that may serve to check the rhetorical exuberance of the enthusiast and lead him to ask whether we yet fully grasp what democracy means. At this point, Butler, as an educator, was thinking clearly and consistently. What many of the critics of education fail to grasp is this, that educators have simply made explicit the presuppositions of contemporary culture. In order to have democracy with liberty, Butler held, education was essential. At this point, his inspiration was, quote, Greek philosophy, end quote. Both Plato and Aristotle had a deep insight into the meaning of man's social and institutional life. To live together with one's fellows in a community involves fitness so to live. This fitness, in turn, implies discipline, instruction, training, that is, education. The highest type of individual life is found in community life. Ethics passes into or includes politics, and the education of the individual is education for the state. Man is not only a social animal, he is a statist animal. Being continuous with all reality, he has no discontinuity with the mass and no law to live by in terms beyond that commonality and continuity. Hence, the education of the individual is education for the state. Man in evolution, unlike man created in the image of God, has no element of transcendence and no law beyond the commonality. He is continuous with his fellow men, and that continuity is best fulfilled in democracy, which is man's quote-unquote completion. Failure to understand the political life of a democratic state and failure to participate fully in it leads directly to false views of the state and its relations to the individual citizen. Instead of being regarded as the sum total of the citizens who compose it, the state is, in thought at least, then regarded as an artificial creation, the plaything of so-called politicians and wire pullers, This view that the individual and the states are somehow independent each of the other is not without support in modern political philosophy, but it is a crude and superficial view. It gives rise to those fallacies that regard the state either as a tyrant to be resisted or as a benefactor to be courted. No democracy can endure permanently on either basis. The state is the completion of the life of the individual, and without it he would not wholly live. To inculcate that doctrine should be an aim of all education in a democracy. 
to live up to it should be the ideal of the nation's educated men. Columbia Teachers College was more faithful to this concept than Butler himself. Man is only man when he is a statist man. Daniel Defoe was thus clearly wrong when his Puritan Robinson Crusoe became, in isolation, himself, civilization and culture, and was able to introduce a savage into Western civilization, present in his own person. If the completion of man by the state should be an aim of all education in a democracy, then to the state has supplanted society as the order of the societal life of man. While Butler was ready to declare as fundamental to our American educational system that while all forms of education may be under government control, yet government control of education is not exclusive nor exclusively a government function. It was still true that the government was inseparable from it. Education is a state function, although the state claims no monopoly in education. Rather, the state protects private initiative. Butler, at this point, is inconsistent with himself. If the state is the completion of the life of the individual, then education must be the exclusive function of the state. If for man there is no salvation outside the institutional church, then it follows that education must be under the jurisdiction of that church, for whatever order claims to complete man or to redeem him, claims accordingly the right to educate him. If the claims of both church and state to be the order of salvation be disallowed, then the right of both to be the educators must be challenged. Butler, with others of his day, saw the necessity of half of that fact. Democracy and the conviction that the support and control of education by the state is a duty in order that the states and its citizens may be safeguarded have necessarily forced the secularization of the school. Equally necessarily, the conviction that man is not the creature of the state must force the disestablishment of the schools. Butler never changed his premises, he simply disliked their logical developments in the hands of men like Kilpatrick. He was not, in any sense, an educational hope for conservatism. Moreover, the educational quote-unquote conservatives had fought the statist schools. Butler had not. True educational conservatism, therefore, was an impossibility for Butler, however much he sought to be a national champion of conservatism. On two grounds, he had rendered such a position untenable for himself. One, continuity and change cannot be made absolutes without thereby giving them free reign over all things. And two, it is impossible logically to begin by socialising the child and then balk at the socialising of the state. If the child educationally belongs to the state and to its care or oversight, it is then a far lesser thing to ask that property be likewise surrendered to the state. Can a man logically surrender his children to the state and then withhold his property without becoming thereby a contradiction, and a monstrous contradiction at that? In Christian terms, in the Reformed interpretation, the issue is simply this. Is it man? the church or the state who was created in God's image. If it be man, then it is idolatry and a violation of the first commandment to kneel before or bow down to church or state. The issue, in Butler's terms, is logically this. There is no issue. Man is an evolving being in an evolving universe which has no law beyond continuity and change, a universe in which all other things, good and evil, life and death, Truth and error are equally ultimate and equally valid and members together with man of one continuous changing abyss of being. Hence, all power to and exaltation of the commonality of being. 